The Get Rich Slow Club podcast is a collaboration between Tash Etchman from Tash Invest and Anna Christina from Perla. The Get Rich Slow Club acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land we record on. From coast to coast, across land, waters and communities, we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Any advice is general and does not consider your financial situation, needs or objectives. So consider whether it's appropriate for you. Welcome to the Get Rich Slow Club podcast, where we take you from beginner to confident investor, where we can teach you everything you need to know about investing. So come get rich slow with us. In today's episode, we are chatting to Paddy Lupari, who saved $14,000 a year in childcare costs by moving states. We also talked about her career change from film to media to cybersecurity, and we talk about why spousal contributions are important when you're on parental leave. If you're looking to increase your income or decrease your expenses, this is the episode for you. Welcome back to the show. We've got Patty Lupari today, and we're very excited to chat with her. But before we do, we're going to do our weekly money loss or win of the week. Patty, do you want to kick it off? Yeah, I would absolutely love to. So win for me this week is around uh, health care insurance premiums. So I recently did a comparison um, with my current provider and a couple of others, and I noticed that I was paying considerably a lot more for my family cover, which now obviously includes my child. Previously, being single, you can kind of get away with a lower or a reduced premium. Um, But now with the child um, included in the family cover, you know, it's really worth comparing with others because my current provider was definitely making me pay a lot more. So at least a hundred dollars more per month compared to what I could find with other providers. So yeah, a hundred dollars a month. It doesn't pay to be loyal. (laughs) No, no. The loyalty tax. Hey, they just smash you on that. You're inspiring me to go relook at my premiums as well. Yeah, yeah when's it, the last time you checked yours, Anna? Uh, I think when Bub was born, so about a year ago, but I, I need to do it again because recently I found out that there might be surgery in the near future and I realized that the coverage I have is really bad. Yeah, I'm just not happy. So, Patty, you've inspired me to get, to put it on yes, my to-do list. to everyone. Especially when you have kids. Mm. 100%. <laughs> that's an awesome one. That's a That's an awesome win. Uh, Tash, do you have a money loss or win of the week? Yes, money loss, but also maybe a win too. I paid off my ATO tax bill finally. I was putting that off to the last day. It ended up being $30,000, which is huge. I knew it was coming, but it still hurts a little bit. But now going forward, I have to do mine in quarterly installments anyway, so it won't be huge again, thankfully. Yeah, I think in a previous episode, I mentioned that I also paid mine off and held off for as long as I could in oh, my offset yeah. account. Yeah. So like I knew I it wasn't my money, too. but just, yeah, still watching it leave was like, oh, ha, I don't like that. <laughs> Terrifying. <laughs> yeah. What's yours, Anna? Yeah. Um, so I, I know that Aldi's cheaper. Everyone talks about Aldi being oh, cheaper. I love Aldi. But I've never really done like a full shop at Aldi. I always like do bits and pieces. And this time I went to Aldi and did a full shop being like, this is what we need for the week. And I must admit, it's significantly cheaper. So I'm really glad that I did that. Where were you before? Did you use Coles or Woolies? Like, who, who did you go? Yeah, I was using Woolies previously and currently do because they had this rewards program going on, these extra rewards where you could get 10% off each each um, shop. And they had some kind of glitch in their system where you could do it online and in store. So I was getting, you know, 10% in store and 10% online but they've changed that recently. So I'm really disappointed and (laughs) looking around for alternatives. And that's why I was like, oh, I'm going to try Aldi and just see how we go. And I think, Tash, to your question, I believe that I probably saved $200. I mean, I did a huge shop. I did a huge shop. I did a huge shop. But maybe 150, maybe I'm being too generous, but I think about 150. I was surprised. Like some of these prices were like $3 off of something that I usually pay at Woolies. So I'm a convert. I'm going to move over to the Aldi, Aldi train, I think. And I got myself some sweatpants. <laughs> so, oh, I love the Aldi sales are great. The best guys. <laughs> I know. I'm such a sucker. I needed sweatpants. It's actually one of the first things I've bought in the past three years. So I'm, I'm all right with that. And that's Money such a win. massive save for like a family of four, right? Yeah. Like yeah. 150. It's huge. That's huge. Yeah. And I, that, because my family is expensive because there's so many of us. Mm. 
So let's kick it off. Patty, what I love about you is that you have a lot of different aspects of personal finance that you focus on. Upskilling, increasing your income, investing and growing your wealth, reducing expenses, and creating long-term value. So I want to impact some of these aspects in today's podcast. And I'd love to start with just talking about increasing your income. That's something that, you know, it gets talked about a little bit, but not as much as it really should. And I think it just needs a little bit more airtime. I know you've taken your career really seriously. I'd love to hear what are some of the things that you've done to increase your income and upskill and focus on your career? Yeah, well, I think I've mentioned a couple of times um, for any of my followers or I guess people that have been watching my journey that I've switched industries several times. And one thing that kind of stuck to me and resonated throughout the whole uh, switching of careers and then also trying new things from a uh, skills perspective is the consistency around soft skills versus technical skills. I mean, there's no perfect balance, but from what I've experienced going from a film background to then um, media to then uh, tech, I'm, I work in cybersecurity now is irrespective of the fields, yes, there's lots of technical skills that you need to have and certification. The overarching theme is people skills or soft skills, if you will. And so I love talking about soft skills because I feel like this, the skill set itself can be applied to any role and to any person. So, you know, emotional intelligence, communication skills, active listening, problem solving, when it comes down to it all, I've seen in career, my career progression that when employers are um, employing new staff or new candidates, they're really focusing on, hey, do I get along with this person? Do I trust this person? Is there that camaraderie, that natural flow of communication? Because really, at the end of the day, if you're going to be spending 80% of your life, work life together or, you know, five days out of the seven, you really want to have those interpersonal skills. So I think I hone on a lot a bit about um, soft skills versus technical skills because technical skills you can kind of pick up with certifications. But yeah, it's for me, it's all about soft skills. It's all about emotional intelligence. How did you jump from, was it film to media to cyber security? That's an incredible career path. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I've always, you know how the, the saying, follow your passion? I've always kind of lived that. <laughs> And That's amazing. <laughs> and that mantra doesn't always pay. <laughs> so let's be <laughs> <Yes>. real. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I studied finance because um, I my ah, my amazing. history. Yeah, so I, yes, yes, finance and law. And my father is a litigator and a um, ethnic parent. So uh, being an immigrant to Australia, my parents always said you can either be an accountant, a lawyer, or a doctor. Those are your three options. <laughs> what about engineer? I'm oh, surprised that yes. didn't make the list. Yeah. Well, I think it also like has something to do with your, um, I guess, your lineage. So my, yeah, yeah. Like, my family are all litigators, lawyers, accountants. So my dad was kind of adamant, like, these are your three options. And I, you know, being that good little girl, I followed that and um, studied finance. But I realized I hate the minutia of actual finance, but I love talking about budgets and personal finance, but that was never an option for me. So then I went with a finance degree, went into film because I thought, hey, I love creating budgets for films and for things that are going to create tangible products or, you know, really inspire creativity in others. And I love films. And that's kind of how I jumped into that film industry. But yeah, it doesn't pay unless you're like an A-lister. That's incredible (laughs) because it's not like something you hear about at school. You're not like, oh, I want to go do budgets for films. You're like, oh, I can be a physio or a lawyer or a doctor or something like that. So it's so cool to hear about those other jobs that people have. Oh, 100%. It's it's really about putting yourself out there. Like you're a point in case, Tash. Like you were studying um, what you were studying and then you found your passion in personal finance and look at you doing all of your accreditations and stuff to become a financial um, advisor. So I'm really inspired by that. People who kind of find their niche within um, a kind of a system that's set up to you can only go one down one path versus the other. So I guess the quick um, background from film to media was that I could do budgets 
in film. And then I started meeting people that were talking more around policy and, um, you know, legislative changes. And I thought, oh, maybe I can work in media in news. So I actually worked in news for five years. Uh, covering the Australian elections, and um, it was so much fun. Yeah, that's so cool. I love <laughs> that. I love the variety. I feel like I get so bored of things so quickly as well. So being able to go, okay, cool, I'm doing budgets for films, and now I'm covering elections, and then I'll go work in cybersecurity. Yeah. What a great career path. <laughs> but what I love about it is also transferable skills, right? It yeah. goes back to those soft skills, Patty, that you were talking about. You know, once you have those skills, you can move from job to job. And actually, research has shown that if you jump jobs more often, often you're more likely to get a higher pay increase uh, than being loyal to your company. In the same way that you talked about being loyal to your insurance company, they're not going to give you, you know, a cheaper rate. Same thing. Your company is not going to give you a raise as quickly as you could if you jumped jumped jobs. So hearing this, it just it really, it, it kind of, in- it's all interconnected, right? 100%. I, I'm saying 100% a lot because I completely agree with all you're saying, Anna having those soft skills and getting along with people and kind of reading the room and having a bit of empathy, you know, everyone is stressed in their jobs. And regardless of what industry you're in, you know, you can get kind of sucked into the bubble and the stresses that occur within the role or within the industry can cause you to almost forget that, you know, at the end of the day, you're just a person and, you know, having that empathy to kind of chill and, hey, hang on, we all have lives outside of this bubble of work, you know, <laughs> which then like from media jumping to cybersecurity, I did um, purposely because of the gap in the um, cybersecurity space for women, specifically women of colour, And working in Canberra really helped because I saw that these policies were um, being advocated by um, white men, but not the women that these policies and programs were shaped for. Um, So I did the jump to cybersecurity with, I guess, the um, initial goal to be a bit more of an advocate, leveraging those communication and emotional um, intelligence skills that I have. I looked at this opportunity and it plays really well. Um, So now I've been advocating (laughs) for more women to join the cybersecurity industry. Um, And there's pathways for upskilling, you know, Um, and I do a lot in terms of working with women that want to go from, say, we've got currently an amazing candidate, a mum of four, who's going from childcare work that she's done for the last 20 years and there's pathways that we're building for her to get into cybersecurity and be skilled up through programs with the local TAFEs and the universities. Like, I love this stuff because I want more yeah, people amazing. to make more money. <laughs> yes. Yeah, especially women. especially women and, you know, people of color and, you know, people in the LGBTQI community. Like, there just needs to be a bit more space. And like you said, if you have people creating policy around issues that are going to affect these groups, you really need these people to be at the table or you're going to be the meal, you know, like, or whatever 100%. the saying is. Is that the saying? Like, Yeah, yeah. yeah for you for know, me, it's like there's the, there's a table, but if there's no seat for you, create your own seat. Make your way to the table. <laughs> yeah, that's so good. I love that you were saying as well that you wanted to make more money. I feel like it's almost still a bit taboo to say out loud that you want to change careers and make more money and make a move like that for money too. So it's so cool acknowledging that, yes, you want to make change, but also we all want to get paid a little bit better as well. Oh, hell yeah. I feel women specifically don't say what they really want. Like they don't go to the table to negotiate for their pay. Like the best tip that I ever learned from um, a HR consultant was, when you're first receiving that contract, negotiate then. Tell them what you're worth. Don't say between, say, this is what I'm worth. And then back it up with like facts, industry, um, you know, benchmarks, all that kind of stuff. But that is the best time to do it because once you've signed that contract, they got you. 
Mm-hmm. And if you've signed at a lower rate, it's going to be harder for you to keep moving up. That's something that I learned much later in my career. I just wanted to demystify the idea that women don't negotiate. In fact, women do negotiate contracts. They do quite aggressively. However, there's biases both by men and women that don't believe that women should get that amount and feel that they're too pushy or too aggressive when it comes to negotiating. So new research shows that women do actually negotiate for a specific wage. It's just that biases that come from society don't allow them to get that money. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I was just jumping into deep, deep into that research recently. And I was like, oh, that makes me so angry. Yes. <laughs> you know, because it, it puts the onus back on women. Oh, you need to negotiate. It's like, no, at, we as a society actually need to change the way that we view people and value people, especially, you know, minority groups or and create space for them to be able to make these um, these changes in their own career paths and, and support one another. So I love that you're doing that, Patty, and you're trying to make a make a way for for others. Yeah, and just showing that it's possible to jump from so many different things and end up in cybersecurity. It's incredible. Thank you. Um, investing is something you're passionate about, and I've seen you post a lot about it on social media. Investing in general in your super and also for your child. Why did you start investing and can you share your investing strategy with us? So I started investing while I was on maternity leave because when I was on maternity leave, I suddenly had all this time to read stuff, listen to things. And I, I, I just noticed the, the large, I guess the large gap between what men had in super versus women and what the average balances were. Yeah, um, it's terrifying. <laughs> so terrifying. <laughs> and I don't know if it's becoming a parent that shifts everything in your mindset that all of a sudden, you know, you've got a plan not just for 10 years, but you're planning for 20 years, 30 years because you have a child. And so I spent a lot of time really consuming as much financial literacy and information I possibly could. Um, because I was such a novice, like having done a finance degree, what, 20 years ago, 13 years ago, whatever, was different to actually just understanding the nuances of what was going on in the, that time. And especially in 2020, when COVID was, you know, at its peak and everyone was stuck at home, it it made me realize that I needed to research more and understand not just superannuation, but investing outside of super. I was very much inspired by you, Tash. Um, oh, when I saw you, <laughs> when I was um, on TikTok and I saw, oh, look at this young, bright person that is thinking about their future and has already started investing. And I think it was that one particular reel that you had where you um, said, you know, if I stopped investing now, by this age, I'll have this much and by by 40. And it really kind of shook me. Um, I thought, holy crap. <laughs> I haven't yeah. even thought about this. <laughs> it's it's amazing when you learn about stuff like that because you don't realize the magic of compounding interest. And you're like, when I really felt the first time I put that in a calculator, I was like, no, this can't be real. That's insane. Being able to end up with, I think the number in that reel was like 5 million if I just stopped investing, which is crazy because I don't have like a super large amount invested really, but it's just very magical. Yeah. And, and that, that just, <laughs> yeah. exactly. And that just shook me and I thought, okay, I need to crack down. I need to start looking um, at, at this, you know, as, as at this vehicle of um, financial independence. So I started investing heavily into firstly my super. I spoke, my partner and I set up, we call them money dates. So once a month we'll go out, very much barefoot investor style. I read his book several times. I love it. <laughs> so good, right? <laughs> and Little so we Scott. went out on a, yeah. um, our money day and I just kind of outlined to him and he's no way interested in personal finance. He's a builder. He doesn't, he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You tell me what to do and I'll do it. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of like the CEO of our household. Um, <laughs> I love that title. Yeah, yeah. The CEO of the household. I like C- that. CEO and CFO. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and CEO have all the titles. Have, yeah, yeah. Have all the titles. <laughs> um, and so I just said, look, I, my super's really low. These are, um, uh, concessions that you can kind of, um, contribute towards my super because my, uh, income this, uh, year is going to be quite low than what it usually is. 
Um, and then there's also options for the government to also contribute um, because I've put some money away. And the money that I put away wasn't specifically for investing or super. It was just like an emergency fund. But I had to dip into that to you know, um, qualify for the government contribution. So you've got to put in like $1,000 of your own post-tax and then the um, government contributes $500. Um, because I was earning way below the 37000 per annum, I do believe, from, this, from the website that I read. And so my partner just agreed and he said, let's do it because it's really important to build up your buffer because women outlive men statistically. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've got to And think- a larger percentage are likely to, you know, be homeless and in poverty. So like doing things like this for yourself and your future is really, really important. Patty, how did you find the money to be able to invest for a lot of people who go on parental leave? It's just you're so strapped for cash. But I guess this was a priority for your family, yeah? Yeah, a hundred. so it was a priority for us. And I also, um, we had gone through the process of when we had our baby, we said, look, everything is going to be secondhand. We're not buying things brand new. We're going to be on a strict budget because the reality is these are things and we still have 20 years, 20, 30 years to go with this child. So let's just kind of, pace it. And so I had a budget when we fell pregnant and I stuck to the budget um, that allowed me to put at least $50 a week away to contribute towards my um, super contribution. I also made sure that my emergency funds were topped up so that we could use that money from the emergency fund as part of the super contribution. I know not many people can do that, but we prioritized as part of our budget. By we, I mean I prioritized <laughs> as CEO, as CEO. <laughs> yeah, as yeah. CEO. <laughs> and my partner was more than happy to contribute towards that. So it helps when you have someone that's kind of open. But you know, I don't think there's many men out there that wouldn't do it. It's also important to have that foresight, knowing what you want to do as a family, knowing that investing is really important, super contributions are important, and being able to prioritize that. Because I think it's a challenge if you're already in a financial hard place and then wanting to make those changes. I know, Patty, I also just wanted to comment. I know you did something quite drastic when it comes to childcare, and I'd love to dive deep into that. Yes. Can you tell, I... us, can you tell us what you did? Yes. <laughs> well... I well, left Sydney. <laughs> yes. That's it. End of the podcast. Yeah, and we moved away. <laughs> moved from Sydney. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we did the drastic move uh, from Sydney to Brisbane um, in 2021 just because the oh the daycare fees were just extraordinary. <laughs> and we just couldn't fathom that the day de- at one point daycare fees were almost on par with our rental weekly. And how many rental? days a week was your bub in? Five days. Yeah, five days. Yeah. So it's crazy. I had to go back to work pretty much as as soon as she was 11 months or I could have gone back a, a lot earlier. And we just did the comparison and it just blew my mind that we were paying so much out of pocket compared to a lot of other states and cities where you could essentially get it uh, you could be paying out of pocket maybe um, about 50% as opposed to Sydney. I didn't realize it was so different. That's crazy that just moving states makes childcare so much cheaper. Oh, it really does. Childcare is somewhere between like $100 to $200 a day. So it really, like, it's huge that, you know, if you're paying 100 I think I'm around 123 I think is my childcare. But I have a lot of friends who are paying 180 190 a day. And so that, that amount is drastic, whether your kid is in for one day or three days or five days. That's where it really it's compounds. Huge. Yeah, it's, it's a huge amount. And do you get like more of a subsidy in Queensland? Why is it so much cheaper there? It's so much cheaper because the fees themselves are a lot less. Are just lower? Okay. So I was in, um, I lived in Paddington and my day rate in Paddington was two twenty. <gasps> what? <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> That's more That's than 200 Oh, my I, God. Uh, I you thought you like what was income high. you need what? like after tax to pay that. That's huge. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. So I used to um, – I remember I was on maternity leave and I'll see a lot of mums out in Centennial Park, a lot of yummy mummies with kids. And I'm thinking, (laughs) oh, wow, don't they want to go back to work? Like being really naive. And then actually finding out that they 
were saving money by not working and yeah, yeah keeping like what do you kids. have to earn to afford that like that's insane that's a huge income to have any money left over have you done the maths on that, Anna? There's also a subsidy that does play into it. Um, I don't know if you know this. <laughs> I'm sure Patty does because as parents, we do. I don't know it in details at all. Yeah, I want yeah. all this stuff from you so far, Anna. Yeah. So um, there's a subsidy that kind of it's a it's a it's a it's a scale. So it depends on how much your family earns. And actually, in in uh, in the new financial year it's going to increase for a lot of families. They're going to be saving a little bit more money. So depending on what you're making, you might be getting 50% off of that, that subsidy. Um, or you might be subsidized only 20% or 80%. It really kind of depends on what it's your income bracket is. Well. And it's, yeah. it, it is, it off, is. But still $110, great. But because the government's also uh, put in the subsidy, a lot of these childcare centers are also increasing their prices. So parents aren't actually seeing a lot of that subsidy. One of the things we have to remember is that a lot of these childcare you know, centers are actually run by companies that are listed on the stock market and that are, you know, trying to make money so that they can pass their their uh, earnings over to their investors. So it's like this weird full circle that you kind of have to think about. And that's why, I mean, uh, uh, the education system probably needs <laughs> a bit of an by overhaul. The sound of it. Yeah, yeah. Oh. But it's just something that people don't think about. I know I absolutely did not think about that before having kids. It's only now that my kids are in, I like to say, early uh, childhood education and care because we've talked about this before. Child care does, is a disservice to <laughs> early learning. Well, the educators. But, yeah. yeah, yeah, but um, I mean, Patty, that pr- must have must have also blown your mind when you when you ran the numbers moving from Sydney to Queensland. Wait, can I ask how much you pay now? If it used to be two hundred and twenty, yeah, for sure. So, um, it, we're paying currently a hundred and five a day. Nice, oh, half price. <laughs> so nice, <laughs> crazy, <laughs> nice. Yeah. Day. Brisbane's looking really nice right now. It really is, and <laughs> um, yeah, not only the the considerable amount of um, savings there, but just also the saving around the transport. So moving around, if I'm having to drop my daughter off, I'd have to you know pay the fuel costs or toll costs to get to daycare. Whereas here, she's just walking distance, and so it's. It's so much better for our lifestyle that she can, you know, be at a center that's nearby versus somewhere that I had to put her in just so she could be near me, um, near to me at work where I previously worked in Sydney. I forget, like I'm from, I'm from Perth, so I always forget how much things like tolls cost people to just travel around and going to Sydney and being shocked by like the smallest bit of road you have to pay for the privilege of driving on it. I just find that insane as well. Oh yeah, another reason why I left. <laughs> Yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> Another reason why I left. Yeah, so the childcare is that whole cost of it just blew my mind because I guess the extension of that is um, if we had stayed in Sydney, well, is she going to go to private school or public school? And how much more is that going to cost? Whereas, you know, if you're already spending so much in childcare in Sydney, then you kind of think, well, then maybe I can afford to send them to, a, you know, a private school. But obviously, it's so much more. But we saved around $26,000 by just making the move. Wow. Like overall, like not just her being in um, the daycare fees, but also the travel, you know, also not paying rent. But, you know, it's different now because we're homeowners. But the massive savings was probably around 14 k which is purely her daycare fees. And is that a year? That's per year. Yeah. And so if you're thinking of four years that, you know, you're, <laughs> you're, a, you're in childcare plus all of the driving that you're doing, it really, really adds up. Yeah, it's incredible. It's like a whole conversation that we're not having enough. Like, can you actually afford to live where you're living? And is moving going to give you such a better quality of life? Plus you're saving money as well. It's incredible. Well, the other thing that you were talking about private schools, right? Like private schools are the most expensive in Sydney, both um, independent schools and Catholic schools. So where you're choosing to live and where you're choosing to put your child in school, it does, it does add up. Hugely. Yeah, we got to the point where we, were, we just thought, well, why do we want to keep up with the Joneses? Mm. Like, this is not bringing any joy to our lives. So we, we made the move to to Brisbane. and Now you're keeping up with the Luparis. 
Yeah, I love this. I want to live your life. You're my new inspiration. Stop. You are. I'm fangirling. <laughs> fangirling all around. And when you moved, I know, um, Patty, you guys, you, you bought a place. And was that kind of part of the plan as well? How does that kind of play into the idea of previously paying rent in Sydney, now you're paying a mortgage. I know a lot of those considerations come with having a child and the type of lifestyle you want. I know I know that's some, something that happened for me and why we moved to where we did and, and so forth. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, absolutely can. It was probably the second uh, most driving factor for us, firstly being daycare um, and secondly being household um, costs. We realized that if we were ever to own a home in Sydney, um, we'd have to move far out west or we would just have to pull out my daughter from daycare because the amount of money we're spending on daycare, we're not saving. So we looked to Brisbane and saw that there's so much more opportunities, lower cost of living up here, but we're not having to spend a million dollars for a crappy house. (laughs) Like we didn't want to buy something brand new. My partner's a builder and we really wanted to add value to our home because for us, our home is as much as an investment as it is like a safety of somewhere we live and we own. But we wanted to um, over time add value and increase its value, obviously, through renovations that my partner could do on the weekend or um, if we plan to maybe do a bit of um, structural um, renovation, like he could do that because that's what he does. And we saw that if we were living in Sydney, we'd still have to fork out a million dollars to buy a crappy old house and then spend another 800000 just doing it up. Just to do mm. it up. Yeah. Just for the privilege of living in Sydney. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. And and paying those giant costs for everything. The right? toll fees. Yeah. Oh, Crazy. My gosh. What, what, what a great way of thinking about your property. I know Tash and I talked quite a bit about whether we think of our house as an investment. And I know you said that you do think of it as an investment. And I guess if you're adding value to it, eventually when you do decide to sell it, it will increase in value, hopefully because of the work that you've done on it as well. Is that kind of how you think about it? Yeah, hundred percent. So I had purchased a, an, an investment property prior to moving up to Brisbane. So that was probably like the third draw card because we had an investment property. We thought, oh, great, we'll move into it. Anyway, I'll give you a quick rundown of what was going through my head. So we moved up the value of the house just skyrocketed by 35%, had all this equity. And I just (laughs) said to my partner, why don't we just buy a house where we want to live? He's like, two houses in 12 months? Are you insane? I'm like, eh, we can do it. Yeah, (laughs) amazing. If you've got the equity, how cool. If the banks are willing to give you a loan, whatever. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) absolutely. And he was, yeah, through gritted teeth, said, okay, let's do it. Listening to the CFO. <laughs> yeah, just yeah, listen yeah. to the CFO. I've done the numbers. We're good. <laughs> An executive yeah. decision stamp. You've made good uh, choices already. Going, <laughs> going forward, it's good. <laughs> so um, we use the equity from our investment property to buy our home that we're living in and renovating. And like we bought in an area that we love and it really helped moving up and living, renting from um, family friends for eight months just to experience different areas. Because when you first move to a new city, you don't really know where you, unless you've lived there or have experience. And we hadn't thought about it as a family group unit. So we did the research for eight months. We tra- We traveled around the area. We went to all of the open homes inspections, looked at properties, and then When this one property that we liked kind of popped up, we thought, oh, great, we'll go for it. And so at that time, obviously, banks were approving so much more than they are right now. So they said to us, you know, you could have a million dollars if you want. And my partner and I were like, why do we want to buy a million dollar house in Brisbane? We just left Sydney. (laughs) You've got the great, you've got such a good mindset. I love this so much. Oh, thank you. We don't need a million dollar house. We'll just have more. You need Patty as your BFF, you know, you're like, oh, I want to buy this thing. And she'll just like run the numbers with you and be like, do you, do you really do? (laughs) What actually brings you joy? I love that. Will the million dollar house bring me joy? Maybe not, but Brisbane will. Yeah. yeah. And so we found a house and I said to him, look at it, not look at it as it is, but what it could be. See the yeah. vision. Yeah. 
And he's like, I'm so bad with stuff like that. I like, like to see it as it is. I can't picture how things will be. So it's great being able to be like, this will be my future dream house and you can fix it and do all the things and it'll be great. <laughs> It also helps if you have like a partner that is a builder that can do all yeah. of the handiwork. So <laughs> I can't, I can't vision it. I'm like, oh, if I can't see it, it doesn't exist, and I can't <laughs> do the planning in my head. Um, and then, yeah, so we bought the house without equity. Didn't need to spend a single cent from our emergency fund um, because that was all saved for a bit of a um, bit of a pre-reno before we moved in because we bought a asbestos um, cottage. So, yay, fun times, learning about that. Luckily, had a partner they could do it himself, so we did save a lot of money there. But um, I guess long story short, we took a big leap of faith, moved to a new city and thought we could buy a home less than a million dollars and eventually it could be worth a million plus. Uh, and I did a lot of research in the areas to buy because I'm a data nerd and it like makes me excited. And the area that we bought is now looking to increase another 10% for doing nothing. That's amazing. You made some really good it's like property decisions so far by the sound of it. Good, but then some people could see it as quite risky. <laughs> yes. I'm sure like you seem to talk about your emergency fund and like you have a, a husband or a partner that's a builder. So you kind of have, you've considered that anyway. Yes. It, uh, it, they've all like kind of worked to my advantage. So, um, but it does help when you have someone that, you know, lives and breathes that construction and renovation space because, you know, he just tells you what, real costs are like. And um, if he's saying to me now, is now is not the time to do a renovation and I'll have to live through my crappy 70s kitchen. I'm like, okay. <laughs> That's I'll fine. Live. We'll compromise. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. Other things are done, right? Yeah. And um, yeah. I do love that you talk about it could be seen as risky as well because oftentimes people make really great leaps when it comes to their finances or their wealth. And a lot of Times it does come to luck. It comes down, down to luck and just taking the risk at the right time. And it, had it been a different time of year or a different decade, it would not have been the smartest move. But you have to kind of weigh up all those things. You need to be prepared and have the emergency fund and, you know, the mindset of what is going to happen and timing can be right and it, it can have a beautiful outcome. <laughs> so I, I, I do like that you appreciated, you know, it can, it can be seen as risky, but it so far it's going well for you. So yeah, hundred percent just on that. Like, I don't want people to think that I've just been so lucky going from these two properties and having these assets. Um, I bought my first property in Melbourne when I lived um, there in my early, uh, late twenties. And I bought a unit near the CBD. Like 2020 was not a good year for that unit in the CBD. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I'm like, hey, I'll take my, you know, wins and losses. But that property was a great starting um, base for me because I was not ready to commit to a house because a lot of people were saying, why are you not buying a house? Are you insane? Oh, I hate that. I have this conversation annoys me so much sometimes. Yeah. Cause I bought an apartment as well. And everyone's like, well, but just buy a house. Houses will always make you money. Why would you not do that? There's so many reasons to not buy a house straight away. Oh, and I'm, I'm so with you there because for me, I thought, well, I want to buy an apartment that's 5Ks from the the city because I want that lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then also because I don't want to have the commitment of a massive mortgage yeah, at yeah. 20 something. No, yeah. thank you. And, and then there's other costs, right? There's also like, what if your roof goes, you need to do the yard. You, you, you know, like no one's going to do that. You're not paying strata fees to someone else who's going to manage, you know, everything else. And I think that that sometimes gets lost in that conversation. Those costs keep going up and up and up with a house. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen quite a few of your reels where you're investing for your child. Why was this important to you? First and foremost, it's it was important to me because my parents never did it. And nowadays it's such a, there's a, there are fewer barriers to entry. Coming from a developing nation, my parents were so scared about putting money in the stock market. You know, my dad had the opportunity to do that for us, but he would rather buy like property for us. And there's so many more costs, upfront costs involved than just purely putting like a thousand dollars away or, you know, um, hundred or whatever it is. But, um, 
I thought, well, this is the easiest way that I can kind of empower my child for their future. I may not have, you know, the the capital to go and buy her a property. You know, that's my ideal scenario is just to buy her something that's there for her um, as she grows up that she can have as an, an investment. Um, but the easiest way for me was to just put, you know, um, money aside into Perla. I love um, Perla for all of the things that, you know, it's just such a great platform. Yes, I know I'm talking about it because we, we didn't pay Patty to say that. <laughs> no, just, just no, to, right. to clarify, we're just fans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just didn't shoot. It's not a plug, and I do refer to Perla in a lot of my content because it's just, it's. I don't want to say foolproof, but it was so easy to understand, and I was always so put off by other platforms to invest for our daughter, and because I found Perla so easy to use, I. You know, I signed up and then I saw the option of signing, um, creating an account for my daughter under my partner's name, just because he's just in that slightly lower tax bracket. But we really wanted to just commit to her future in whatever way we could. We thought of it firstly as an education fund. So if she wanted to go to university, which I'm hoping she, she will, it's like I'm not enforcing it, that she has money to fund her university. Um, I know there's options for HEX. I never got to have an option for HEX um, being an international student, but she does. But I want her to have the work ethic that she doesn't think that she can just go to university for free. Like it's definitely not free. I know there's HEX, there's a debt, but I want her to have that money that she's working towards putting aside to pay for her university. Yeah, there's only extra costs with uni as well if she studies something like teaching or a healthcare degree where you're doing so many hours of unpaid placement. Like that requires a lot of money as well. Yeah, something I didn't know about until Tash <sighs> commented. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, Insane, that, and that was, on a, like, that was an eye-opener for me as well. Like I thought, yeah, if she does want to do this, then she's got to actually fund herself there too. So we created the... Um, portfolio specifically as education, but it might change as she grows older. Like I really want to instill the um, importance of compound interest because my parents spoke about it, but it never was instilled. And now I feel like I need to kind of break that barrier and ensure that she has that. And I've been, you know, also talking about it to my family for, um, for their children as well to invest, just put some money aside. Yeah, it's incredibly powerful. I just wanted to bring something up that I love that you said, Patty, is that you created an account in her for her. So I'm assuming it's a minor account in your partner's name. And um, because it sounds like they potentially earn less than you, is that was that one of the reasons? Yes, definitely. Yeah, cool. yeah definitely. And that's a huge consideration that people don't think about as well when it comes to who you're going to put on the account, right? Like, cause you can book both your names, but then there's a consider a tax consideration that has to happen there as well. And I know that was something that my family talked, talked about as well. And, uh, when you're investing for kids, you have to think about that because you're going to get dividends payments and so forth. And who is it going to affect? It's going to affect the person whose name is on the account. Um, it's very obvious that your strategy is diversified across assets and goals. Do you have some quick tips that you can provide to people listening who want to increase their income, invest, or reduce their expenses? Okay, so quick tips. Um, I might start off with the increase increase your income. Highly recommend getting to know your manager, getting to know your um, HR, because there's there could be opportunities there where you can you know participate in inter office uh, projects. Really great way to get your name out there is when people can kind of um, sponsor you and champion you internally. I've done that a couple of times where I've put my hand up for maybe projects that are not within my remit, but benefit the business as a whole, where I've said, yep, sure, I'll come and be the project manager here, or I'll do this there, Um, more than happy to help. So then more people in the business get to know you. And that's where you can kind of showcase your soft skills. So have that emotional intelligence. You may not be the technical lead on a project or a particular um, product, but if you're there showing that willingness, I feel like when it comes to that time where you're reviewing your pay or you're talking about how can I get my bonus or how can I get my pay rise, you can say, hey, here's a list of things I've done. This, these are people that sponsor me within the organization. Please feel free to talk to them. And it's like a really quick way for you to then show, 
you've added value to the business and therefore you're a value to the business. So that's my quick little tip, if you can, for increasing income. Uh, in terms of investing, learn, listen to podcasts like these, Equity Mates, Rask, just learn as much as you can so you feel comfortable. So, you know, whatever your risk tolerance thermometer is, if there's such a thing, you can feel comfortable when you're putting your money into investments and kind of riding that roller coaster because it's never a cruisy ride. There's always ups and downs as we've seen in the last three years. And then, yeah, have an emergency fund. I'm big on emergency fund or whatever the barefoot investor calls them, the different buckets. Love it. Yeah. Do the buckets. <laughs> My favorite one from this episode was move states, move away yes. from the expensive yeah. states. Not a yeah. quick tip, but a good one. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> yes. Plan, plan, plan. <laughs> emergency yeah. fund. Do all the numbers. Have all the maths. <laughs> yep. Be the CEO and CFO of your household. Oh, I yes. love that. I'm going to call myself that now. I love that so much. Yes, Are you both queen. the CEO and the CFO? Yes. Yes, I am. Yes. <laughs> love it. And the CEO. I am all the organization. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Love, love. And the people and culture person as well. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Chief HR, people and culture. <laughs> Awesome. Well, Patty, thank you so much for being on the show. I think you were fantastic. We learned a lot of great information when it comes to reducing your expenses and increasing your income. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. This is brilliant. I love hearing about people just doing different things and not just staying in Sydney or whatever it is. Like that was amazing hearing that you've moved and done all those really cool things. They're thank hard you. things, hard steps <laughs> yeah, to they're, take. They're, you they're know? hard. It's, and it's not, you don't hear about people doing it every day. Like it's really hard to do something that you don't see lots of other people doing yourself. So it's very cool. Yeah. Thank you. It's been so much fun chatting to you both. I guess it helps when you're a bit of a traveler at heart. You can just up mm. and leave. <laughs> right? Yes. right, Anna? I, can, I feel that a little bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where can everyone find you? I know I follow you on Instagram. Oh, thank you, Tash. Everyone can find me on um, Patty on the Money at, on IG. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much for joining us. If you found this episode helpful, please rate us five stars, write a review, or share with a friend. If you're new to investing, make sure to listen to our first 10 episodes. Follow us at Get Rich Slow Club or Tash at Tash Invest or me at Anna Christina. This show was brought to you by Natasha Edgman, who is an authorized representative, 12-99881 of Guideway Financial Services, AFSL 420367 and Perla, who is an authorised representative, 1281540 of Sanlam Private Wealth, AFSL 337927. Knowledge is power, especially when it comes to investing. So make sure you check out our financial services guides and read the product disclosure statement and target market determination for any investments you're considering. See our show notes for more info.